Welcome to module 7, our last module. In this module, we'll talk about approximate methods for solving indeterminate structures. And these methods are really what you're more likely to apply in a practical setting because they allow you to deal with realistic structures that may be highly indeterminate um, and are very useful for validating computational results. So the objectives for today are first to explain some of the assumptions and strategies used for approximate analysis. Now, approximate analysis is actually quite large, and so we won't be able to get to every single topic. We'll just look at a very specific case of approximate analysis, but at least it'll give you a feel for the topic. And um, then we'll use these strategies to solve both indeterminate beams and indeterminate frames. So, let's just give the big picture here of what approximate analysis is about. As the name suggests, approximate an analysis entails guessing or approximating something about the behavior in the structure. Generally, what we're trying to do is trying to make a indeterminate structure look determinate by making a set of assumptions. Now, what we'll be focusing on is actually guessing inflection points in the structure and turning those inflection points into hinges, right? So let's take a fixed fixed beam, right? That's third degree indeterminate. Uh, but we know from previous analyses that it should have two inflection points, right? Somewhere roughly around a fourth of a f one fourth and three fourths of the length of the beam. So we'll talk in more detail about this in a moment, but the overall idea here is that we want to approximate this beam as the following structure, where we've replaced the points of inflection with hinges. We can do that because we know that at points of inflection, the moment is zero, right? Same as hinges. And so now we've eliminated two degrees of indeterminacy. And if you add to this the fact that the horizontal reactions are zero, okay, then we've turned this into a completely determinate structure that we can break apart and solve. So that's the general idea. So where is approximate analysis useful? Well, first of all, it's useful in preliminary design when trying to size members. When I say size members, I mean selecting their dimensions. So things like the cross-sectional area, or the area moment of inertia. And if you think about it, for indeterminate structures, because of the compatibility conditions, because of the force displacement relationships, we actually need to know beforehand what the material properties are, and especially what the uh, dimension, uh, geometric properties are, so A and I, beforehand. And so exact indeterminate analysis is impossible without knowing those, those values. So by turning it into a determinate structure, we can actually eliminate the need for those values and get approximate forces for our members that then allow us to select some initial values for A and I, and potentially E as well. So to summarize, exact and determinate analysis requires knowledge of geometric and material properties but if we make structure, the structure determinate, we can solve directly for forces and then use that information to choose those properties. Secondly, and also very common, is using approximate analysis to verify the results from an exact computational analysis or even an exact hand calculation. These are very prone, as you've probably seen, to computational errors. And approximate analysis gives us a way to solve the structure in a different way, in a simpler way uh, that is less prone to error and still get us values that are close enough to be comparable. So if these values are off by quite a bit, then we know that perhaps a computational error has occurred. So exact analysis is prone to error, but approximate methods give us a different approach to solving for forces that can help us identify those errors. All right now it's not uncommon as you can see in the note for 
approximate analysis to be off by 10 or 20 percent, right? So it shouldn't be taken as a final value, but often by hand, this is what you'll do. And then once you're sure about your computations, obviously you can do more sophisticated analysis and exact analysis there. So now let's look a little closer at this inflection point idea by looking at a couple of standard beam configurations and observing how the inflection points change depending on how we change the support conditions and the loading condition. So let's start with a fixed fixed beam and just change the loading condition. On the left we have a fixed fixed beam with a distributed load and you should be able to calculate the corresponding shear and moment diagrams using the flexibility method. Looking at the moment diagram and solving for when it intersects zero gives us the position of the inflection point. So if you were to do that, you would get that it's 0.21 times L from either end. Okay, and, and the nice property about this is actually that it holds regardless of what the distributed load is. Okay, so the point of inflection is only going to be a function of the length, and it's always going to be 0.21 times the length. So for a fixed fixed beam with a distributed load, we know that the points of inflection are going to be 0.21 away from the end, 0.21 times L. For a the same beam, but with a point load at the center, again, we can use force method to solve for the moment diagram at the bottom, and then find the zero points of that moment, and we'll notice that now it's a quarter of the length from either end. So those are good numbers to have in mind. It's also good to notice the effect of going from a distributed load to a central point load in that it forces the points of inflection to actually move inward. Now let's look at some different boundary conditions. So on the left, now we've removed the fixed supports, we've gone to a simply supported beam. Obviously this is determinant, so easy to solve for the moment. And we notice that now there's no points of inflection in the middle of the beam, in fact, the points of inflection are at the ends. Okay, so in this case, you could think of it as being zero times L from either end. And if we now switch one of the supports to a fixed support, and again, do the same procedure, solve for the moment, we see that we have one point of inflection at zero, and then the other one at, again, a quarter of the length. So the, the effect to observe here is that as we switch the, the supports from fixed to pin, we move the points of inflection towards the end. In fact, a pin support is always going to have a point of inflection at that pin. So now armed with that knowledge, let's see how we can tackle a simple approximate analysis. So let's take this beam with two rollers and one pin. The first thing you should do is determine the degree of indeterminacy. That will tell us how many hinges we need to add to this particular structure. So in this case, it's easy to see that there's one extra roller. So degree of indeterminacy is equal to one. And so we need one hinge. The second thing to do is try to figure out where those hinges would go approximately. Or in other words, try to find the inflection points. And we can do that fairly easily by drawing the qualitative deflected shape. Right? This is why we made such a big deal out of it earlier. So my qualitative deflected shape is going to look roughly like this. I know the left side of B is going to deflect a little bit more just because it's, it's a longer span and so it's more flexible okay but roughly speaking I know there should be two points of inflection one to the left of B and one to the right of B 
Of course, we also have points of inflection at A and C, right? But those are already hinges, so we can't really add a hinge there necessarily. And so I'm left with two points. So I have two choices, and I just need one of them to be a hinge. So I'm going to just pick the one to the left of B. Okay, so we need to come up with approximately what that distance is from B. All right, so that's step two. Draw the deflected shape and pick a point of inflection. Or multiple ones, depending on your degree of indeterminacy. All right, so number three is find the length of that. So number three now is to approximate the position of that inflection point. And we'll do that by studying roughly how this section of the beam, AB, relates to the standard configurations that we looked at before. So it's not quite a pinned pinned, right? Because there is an internal moment there at B. If we were to cut through this, the beam is able to rotate somewhat there, but there's also a moment internally there at B. So let's let's draw that out. So if I were to cut a section there at B, we would see obviously the two reactions, but we would also see an internal moment from the beam itself trying to restrict the, the rotation around that point. Okay? So this beam is really somewhere between fully pinned pin and pin fix or roller fix right in other words it's not fully fixed because it is allowed to rotate somewhat around B obviously but it's not fully pinned because there is an internal moment there restricting the, the rotation so the point of inflection should lie somewhere in between the corresponding points of inflection for these two configurations. For the roller pin case, it was zero. For the fixed case, if we go back to this case here, that would be quarter, 0.25 times L. So it would be 0.25 times 24, which is the length of AB, or 6 feet. And so putting this together, we can say that L must be greater than 0, but less than 0.25 times the length of AB. And so here's where the judgment comes in and the part that might make you the most uncomfortable. But we have to choose some proportion of L, A, B, and I suggest that you choose something, some round number. So either 0, 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that. And here I'm going to make the argument that the condition of A, B is closer to roller fix than it is to roller pin. Right, because that beam is going to be exerting a significant moment on on and resisting the rotation at B. So I'll go with 0.2, right? So I'm saying that I think it's closer to the second configuration. Again, this is just a judgment call. And so I'm going to say that L is equal, approximately equal, to 0.2 times the length of A B, or 4.8 feet. So once we've decided on that position of the point of inflection, then it's a relatively simple indeterminate analysis after that point. So notice how now I've changed the structure so that there is a hinge at point D, 4.8 feet from B. So we know how to solve this. We simply split the structure at D into this AD beam on the left and the DBC beam on the right. And we know that at D, the internal loads are only vertical and horizontal forces. So there's going to be a DY 
on a dx and equal and opposite on the other side. Okay, and then just using simple statics at this point, we would get that dx is equal to zero, dy is equal to 28.8 kips, and same thing on the other side. And then we can go ahead and also solve for the reactions. So I encourage you to verify these numbers, but again, this is nothing more than invoking the equations for static equilibrium of these two free body diagrams. Now let's look at an example of a frame. And this example is actually really important because it can set the stage for doing this analysis for really large frames, right? So multi-bay, multi-floor frames. But we'll start with this simple example. So we have a pin-pinned frame with a distributed gravity load. So this could be the self-weight of the structure or live loads, but a very common configuration. And again, we'll apply the steps here. So step one is to determine the degree of indeterminacy. Again, this is in uh, I equal to one because we have an extra reaction. We have two pins where this could easily be a pin roller to be determinate. So we need at least one hinge. Now for step two, let's approximate the deflected shape. I know that B and C are not going to move, so I'll get something like that. And then the right angles need to be preserved. So I get something that looks like this. Now the points of inflection here are actually going to be quite subtle, but they are going to be in from the, the two ends, B and C. Right? And you can kind of intuit that based on the fact that they are close to being fixed fixed conditions, right? B and C. And so we'd like to know what those, those lengths should be. So I'm actually going to cheat a little bit here. And instead of picking only one hinge, which is all I need, I'm gonna actually keep both of them. This way I preserve the symmetry of the problem and I make this a whole lot easier to solve. Now note because we're dealing specifically with vertical loads, even though adding two hinges makes this structure unstable, it is sta still stable under this loading configuration. It would only be unstable if I were to put a lateral load on it. So because I'm dealing with a specific loading configuration, it's okay to add more hinges, right? So this is another benefit of approximate methods. We can actually cheat a little bit in that way. So, so I'll pick both. All right, so the last thing to do is actually find out what those L's are. And we're going to think about this in the same way that we did for the last case. So for BC, we know it's somewhere between a fully fixed fixed and a pin roller or pin pin, right? So it's somewhere between the configura configuration on the left where the inflection points are 0.21 times the length in from the ends or the pin roller configuration where their inflection points are right at the ends. Now, of course, the exact position of the inflection points is going to depend primarily on the stiffness of these columns to bending, right? So if the columns are able to bend a lot, then the inflection point may actually be quite close to, to the ends. But if these columns are very stiff, the structure may not rotate very much at all. And then so it may be actually very close to 0.21L. So take this with a grain of salt. There's really no universal method. It really depends on the on, on the structure itself. But for, let's say, beams and columns of roughly similar proportions, dimensions, um, we would expect this to be roughly somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to go with 0.1. Okay. Again, 0.15 would be okay if you picked, uh, you know, even 0.5. That might be reasonable. Uh, just pick somewhere in the middle, right? You don't want to pick 0.21 and you don't want to pick zero. And again, I should make these LBC just to be completely clear what I'm talking about. All right, so we'll go with L equal to 0.1 times LBC. This is kind of the standard choice for any of these frames being gravity loaded. So I just recommend you go with 0.1 in most of these cases. So our final approximate structure looks like this. We've got two hinges at the top. Each hinge is six feet in from, from each end. 
right? This is 0.1 times the total length of 60. And we've got the distributed gravity load acting down. All right, so from here on, it's actually a pretty, again, simple determinant analysis, right? We'll start with this middle portion between the hinges. So that will be 48 feet long, and thus the total load on this beam will be 115.2 kips, right? 48 times 2.4. And it will be supported by essentially the shear forces at those hinges, right? There's no moment to support it. And that will simply be that load divided by two. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm taking advantage of the symmetry here. And so that will be 57.6 kips on both sides. Again, I'm assuming here that the horizontal loads are zero because we're dealing with a gravity load only, a vertical load only. Now that gives us part of the picture of the top beam. We still need to find the forces on the sides, right? So I'm just going to go to the right. I'm going to assume that that's identical to the left because again, it's a symmetric structure here. And so then we can draw that six foot portion to the right that has a, again, the same distributed load over it. So the total load there is 14.4 kips. And the supporting reactions on the left side is simply that shear force from the other beam in the opposite direction. So 57.6 kips there. And then on the right side, we do have both a shear and a moment because that is a fixed connection there. And so using equilibrium again, we get a shear on the right for of 72 kips. And that moment is going to be 388.8 kip feet. And again, we can, we can assume that's the same on the other side. So using that information, we can draw the shear and moment diagrams for that top beam, which I'll do quickly here. Right, so we get a shear going from positive 72 to negative 72 on the right side, passing through that 57.6 at the hinges. And then we get a moment diagram starting at negative 388 going up through 691.2 and then back down to negative 388.8. And of course, it passes through zero at those points of inflection as well. So the maximum moment, positive moment, is 691.2, right in the middle. And the maximum negative moments happen at the ends. Again, those are approximate values. If you were to change the position of the inflection points, obviously these would change by a bit. For reference, the exact values of the end moments are negative 404.6 kip feet. So we were approximately off by 4%, which is pretty darn good if you ask me. So that's it for this lesson. In summary, if we can make educated guesses at the points of inflection, we can actually get pretty close at the exact answers, right? And this is a great method for validating exact computations or preliminary sizing of members.